Okay, that's great. I think uh, everyone can hear me and thank you for all the participants on the line today. So my name is Ajit Johal. I'm a clinical pharmacist and I am the founder and director of a BC not-for-profit organization called immunize.io, which has the mission statement, taking our best shot at immunizing the world. So my uh, specialty is immunizations and I provide a lot of education and uh, wor uh, workplace and pharmacy-based clinics to provide access to immunizations. So now is uh, an, no more than an important time than ever to get immunized, especially with the current COVID-19 pandemic. So this session is called Protect Yourself This Coming Influenza Season, and it's, it's aimed at how to protect yourself and your lungs during a global, global pandemic, because we know that uh, with respiratory diseases like COVID-19, um, there's a greater risk for, for poor outcomes for those who have underlying respiratory uh, illnesses. So we want to talk about how do we protect ourselves as best as possible, especially in the fall when we're going to have COVID-19, influenza, pneumonia, and all these other sort of respiratory diseases that can uh, provide harm. So just a bit about myself, as I mentioned, I'm a clinical pharmacist. I work as an educator. I also work uh, with the UBC Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences, where I'm a uh, clinical instructor and course coordinator on uh, courses for pharmacists on immunizations. Special thanks to BC Lung Association for sponsoring uh, this webinar uh, and for uh, bringing me in to speak to you today on this topic. And a special thank to Sanofi Pasteur for sponsoring the, uh, the activity, this educational learning activity. So we'll start with what is the impact of respiratory diseases on lung health? Why are the lungs so susceptible uh, to disease and, and why do those with underlying lung conditions have worse outcomes uh, with these diseases? So the lungs in themselves are sort of a vital organ for breathing, gas exchange, for oxygenating our tissues, and it's important. So as per the BC Lung Association mandate and mission statement, if you can't breathe, nothing else matters because that sort of exchange of oxygen uh, is, is, is vitality, it's energy, uh, it's, it's a real, real harm wreck of life. So it's very important that you keep your lungs healthy. Unfortunately, it's also the entry point for a lot of inhaled diseases. So these respiratory diseases like influenza, like pneumonia, like COVID-19, they tend to have very bad sort of replication patterns in the lung tissue, uh, especially those who have impaired lung function. So the lungs in themselves have a very important uh, me defense mechanisms against uh, respiratory pathogens. So there's the cilia, which is little hairs uh, in, the, uh, in the airways uh, and in the back of the throat, and mucus as well, where it traps particles like dust, pathogens. There's also some um, immune system cells in there that help clean up uh, pathogens as well. The problem is with things like smoking and even uh, inhaled, the long-term effect of inhaled pa uh, particles uh, this sort of impairs this defense. This allows pathogens to kind of get in. Also, if, if uh, we have underlying conditions like COPD, we already have lost some of our lung function. So if these respiratory diseases come, uh, then there's not that much of a buffer to, to lose any more lung function where things start to go badly. So we look at COVID-19, we can see that respiratory diseases have a nine times greater mortality rate. So this is, I guess, the two most important concepts. If we have an underlying lung condition or respiratory condition, it doesn't increase our risk of getting COVID-19. So that's an important piece. You're not at a greater risk of contracting it. So there's things you can do like social distancing, hand hygiene, not touching your face, wearing a mask, uh, and, and making sure other people wear a mask so that prevents the transmission. But the real danger is when it's contracted, if you get the disease, then the outcomes are always more severe. So nine times greater for COVID-19. Now there's other diseases. We're coming into flu season, which is starting soon, um, that uh, those with underlying lung conditions actually have a 12 times greater risk of, um, from dying from influenza. So it's not just COVID-19, but it's also things we have vaccines against too. 
And then, of course, we look at pneumonia. So those with chronic lung diseases like asthma or COPD are at risk, increased risk of complications of influenza and pneumococcal disease. So both vaccines are recommended. Even if you've been hospitalized with pneumonia in the past, it's still very important to optimize your medications if you have COPD, immunizations, have an action plan, and smoking cessation. So those are the top four priorities uh, you can do to stay healthy if you have COPD. So the other thing I want to mention before we get into safe vaccination practices is the Canadian Thoracic uh, Association recommends that during the COVID-19 pandemic, those with COPD are at high risk. So they recommend staying home whenever possible. If you can work from home, if you can do things from home, uh, do so. Also, uh, continuing your inhaled medications is very important uh, because that helps with, uh, with lung function and, and breathing. They also recommend that if you're on oxygen, you continue that. And they also recommend that you stay up to date on your immunizations. So even though we don't have a COVID-19 vaccine, it's very important that we get vaccinated against things like influenza and pneumonia to take those pathogens out of the equation. So as we move to vaccinations, um, it's very important that uh, you get vaccinated against influenza this season and pneumonia if you haven't gotten that already. So it is recommended to get vaccinated during a pandemic. If, you, if we stop immunizing, then other diseases also come back and that further puts a burden on the hospital. So for safe to receive a vaccination safely this coming influenza season, uh, both the vaccinator and you getting the vaccine should wear a mask at all times. So this doesn't have to be an N95. It can be a simple uh, uh, disposable or a cloth uh, mask. So when you receive an immunization, when you go to the clinic for an immunization or the pharmacy, wear the mask and the person providing your immunization will, be, will have a mask as well. Um, when you're at the clinic, you practice social distancing. And when you're after you're waiting, after you're done the immunization, you also practice uh, social distancing. Um, and then also because the clinics and pharmacies are going to be quite busy this time of year, it's always best to have an appointment-based vaccination so that you know what time you're coming in, people can clean between uh, patients uh, getting immunizations and there's not too much traffic to maintain the social distancing. Also, uh, many clinics and pharmacies are hosting vulnerable patient uh, immunization hours or days so that, uh, that those are times where there's less clinic traffic. So those are some tips how to receive a vaccination safely, but most importantly, the benefits of getting vaccinated are much greater than the risks of not getting vaccinated, even during a COVID-19 pandemic. So as mentioned, booking appointments, screening is important as well. So if you do have symptoms of um, any influenza or any sort of COVID-19 like symptoms, do not go to the clinic for immunization. Even Dr. Henry says to carry on immunizing, it's more important than ever. So the other thing we want to mention is that it is safe to get an immunization. I mentioned social distancing, maintaining six feet apart, but there is no needle that is six feet long. Um, so when you get an immunization, you will have to get close to your provider. Your provider will have to get close to you to give the injection. The good thing is, though, um, is that the greatest risk is face-to-face -face contact for at least 15 minutes. So uh, when you get an injection, it takes all of 15 to 30 seconds just to get the IM injection, and then you separate again for social distancing. So in terms of ranking your risk of getting COVID-19 from, from getting an immunization or seeing a doctor, uh, it, is, it is considered low risk because basically to increase your risk, you need to have the three Ds, which is diversity, distance, and duration. So even if the distance is short, the duration is also short. The problem with contracting the disease is if the distance is short and the duration is long. So even experts say that going to the doctor and receiving an immunization is considered a low risk. Uh, because all the protocols are in place, it's clean, uh, and especially with a lot of clinics and pharmacies doing appointment-based, it'll lower the traffic coming through. The other uh, 
recommendation is that if you're getting um, a flu shot this season, which is highly recommended, especially if you have COPD or asthma, is that you want to maximize your visit. Uh, if you're getting one immunization, you should inquire and, and also get other immunizations that you need because the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, which is a national body which makes recommendations across the country, mentions that we want to offer multiple vaccines if required to minimize the number of healthcare encounters. So they don't want you coming back to the clinic multiple times for immunizations. If you're coming once to get a flu shot, you should also get things like Shingrix and pneumonia if you haven't done so already. It is perfectly safe to receive multiple immunizations in a single visit. It's actually recommended because it doesn't strain your immune system in any way and it limits your chance of going out into different uh, healthcare institutions, clinics, pharmacies. If you're going once for a flu shot, you should get multiple immunizations uh, if, you, if you require them. Okay, so now that we're getting into flu season, what are the current types of influenza vaccines that are currently available? Because there are many options. There's not just one flu shot, there's many different options. So this year uh, in British Columbia, uh, there will be no changes, despite the fact that there were some um, recommendations and support for an expanded universal program, which would mean everybody qualifies for a free influenza vaccine. Uh, but it's still the same criteria. So those very young, so six months to five years of age, those over 65, and those with qualifying medical conditions. And that certainly includes COPD and asthma. And also those capable of transmitting influenza to those at risk. So anybody living with those who have COPD or asthma uh, should also get a flu shot to prevent them from transmitting to those who will have poor outcomes. Um, so that's the criteria. So everyone qualifies if they fit these categories, but there's multiple products. So um, the government will be covering the trivalent inactivated influenza vaccine, which contains protection against two A strains and one B strain. But there are other options that are uh, not funded, but have some better enhanced, we call them enhanced options to provide some better protection against the flu for those at high risk. So we start with the standard uh, dose of the trivalent vaccine, which is the one that will be covered for free uh, for those that qualify. Um, so that one provides protection against two A strains and one B strain, and that'll be covered across the board. Uh, and it should be distributed probably um, after the Thanksgiving long weekend at clinics, doctor's offices, and pharmacies. So there's also the quadrivalent vaccine. So you, the one that was publicly funded is TRI, so three. Quadrivalent means four. So that one covers two A strains and plus one extra B strain. And that extra B strain can actually cause problems. So we see sort of a trend here of B strains circulating uh, from the year 2000 to 2013. You can see it's an upward trend. Um, last season, um, there was a spike in B cases near the end of flu season. And even in certain provinces, we're seeing an upward trend of B strains. So it is probably beneficial to get a quadrivalent vaccine, which provides that extra B strain protection, because that just gives you more protection uh, in a time when we need all the help we can get to prevent um, respiratory disease. So um, this one may present itself in the public program, but it's limited doses. So you could ask for a quadrivalent, but in most cases you won't get it. It is actually available now for private pay. So clinics and uh, some pharmacies will probably be selling it for about $25, but it is available now. Uh, the flu mist vaccine is more for, uh, is, is recommended for pediatric use. So children who are afraid of needles, uh, so that one is not an injection, it's something that gets sprayed in the nose. Um, it's recommended for 2 to 17 years of age, so that's an option for those who are needophobic um, and uh, want to get protected by, by the nasal vaccine. Keep in mind that the injection does have better effectiveness than the nasal uh, vaccine. So the, new, the newest vaccine on the block this season uh, in Canada is the cell-based vaccine. So all of these vaccines discussed so far are made in eggs. Uh, this one's actually made in 
cell base. So uh, the reason why that is beneficial is because mutations can occur in eggs and that's what leads to a mismatch between uh, strains and vaccine. What they thought they matched it changed in the egg medium, uh, so then what's actually circulating doesn't match as well. So uh, the cell-based vaccine is sort of uh, uh, showing preliminary evidence to be preferred in the 18 to 64 age category because it has better matching to H3N2, which is a particularly problematic strain of flu, which is often mismatched due to drifted eggs. So that's uh, um, an option as well. So that would be a quadrivalent vaccine made in cells uh, that is uh, sort of a new enhanced option. It is more expensive than the one made in eggs. So as mentioned, the QIV made in the egg medium retails for about $25. The cell-based one would probably is looking at about double the price, so about $50 for that vaccine. So the last enhanced options are those for those over the age of 65. So those over the age of 65, especially if they have chronic medical conditions like cardiovascular or respiratory conditions, are at the highest risk of death and disability from influenza. The other challenge is as we age, our immune system ages with us. So um, as we get over the age of 65, we're less responsive to vaccination. If we use the same standard dose TIV in the publicly funded program in somebody over 65 versus somebody who's less than 65, you can see how much better the response is, is in younger patients and how poor it is uh, in those over the age of 65. So to help with that, we have two options. So we can add something called an adjuvant, which boosts the immune response. So the adjuvanated flu vaccine is Fluad. And Fluad um, is also available in the publicly funded program. So if uh, in the next couple weeks, when the free vaccine comes out, if you're over 65, uh, try and request Fluad because that has an adjuvant to provide a better immune response. Um, but the best vaccine with the best evidence and the best data, and you may have uh, been aware of this with the, with the announcement uh, from the province uh, a few weeks ago, is the high-dose vaccine. So the high-dose vaccine contains four times the amount of antigen, and that gives the immune system more to work with for those over 65 so they can mount a strong immune response. This vaccine is nationally recommended as the one with evidence of better protection for those over the age of 65 and it's actually uh, recommended that it should be used at the individual level uh, as the preferred option. So the province has actually covered it for those living in long-term care and assisted living to provide that group the best protection they can against influenza. So the data is consistent and compelling in that the high dose vaccine is more effective than the standard dose that's covered in publicly funded programs. Um, so things like pneumonia hospitalization, all hospitalization, influenza like illness is reduced. As mentioned, the high dose vaccine will be covered for those 65 years of age and older living in long-term care facilities. So the high dose vaccine is covered for those in long-term care and assisted living. Those doses should be coming out as mentioned after the, the Thanksgiving long weekend. If you're a community living senior and you want to get better protection against influenza, you can actually purchase the high dose vaccine now. It is available now. Uh, and, it, and I would actually recommend getting it in the next two weeks before the publicly funded vaccine comes out. And the, and the reason for that is two reasons. One, um, the sooner you get vaccinated against influenza, the sooner you're protected. It takes about two weeks to gain antibodies against influenza. The sooner we do it, the sooner we're protected. And the other thing is it might, a lot of people might find it helpful to avoid the rush once the publicly supply comes out. So this is a, a public, uh, it's a private pay option, and it usually retails between about $75 to $80. Um, so some pharmacy locations will be carrying the vaccine this fall. It is available now. There is a, a clinic locator where you can find who's carrying it, or um, there is a, a location in Vancouver um, 
that uh, I can provide the information for uh, that does have supply of high dose. Okay, so ultimately, you should also, as mentioned, determine what vaccines are best for you. Now is, is a more important time than ever to be fully vaccinated against diseases that can limit your risk of infection, especially during a COVID-19 pandemic where there is no COVID-19 vaccine. So this is sort of the NACI recommendations for older adults. Um, you should have your tetanus diphtheria booster every 10 years. Those over the age of 50, there is a strong national recommendation to be vaccinated against herpes zoster or shingles with the Shingrix vaccine. Influenza should be done annually with the high dose vaccine being the preferred option in those over 65. Uh, pertussis is also an important immunization. It's not publicly funded, but uh, it is important uh, contact disease. And then of course, pneumococcal disease. There's two types, there's the polysaccharide and then there's the conjugate. And uh, it's important to know which ones you've had and to know the difference between the two because the polysaccharide is provided uh, free for those over the age of 65 or less than 65 if they have chronic uh, lung conditions. It provides protection against a lot of strains, but it doesn't provide that strong of immune response. So uh, the polysaccharide is, is not as strong of an, of an immune response than the conjugate. The conjugate provides protection against 13 strains, but it provides a strong, robust immune response. And the implications of this, actually, uh, to explain it, uh, try not to get too technical, is that with a conjugate, we actually prevent uh, pneumococcal pneumonia. So um, with the polysaccharide, with the free vaccine, we're only preventing invasive pneumococcal disease. So this means that um, you get pneumonia in your lungs, and then it spreads to the rest of your body. And that's a, that's a bad outcome, you don't want that. And that's what the vaccine does to protect the polysaccharide, the free one. Now the conjugate vaccine, uh, it actually takes that one step further where because it has such a strong immune response, it reduces carriage of the pathogen in your nose and the back of your throat. So it does that versus the free one doesn't. And it also provides a strong immune response in that it can actually prevent pneumococcal pneumonia. So it prevents the pathogen from actually getting into your lungs, which then prevents it from getting into the blood. So this is kind of where the conjugate will block a lung infection. And then if you've gotten the polysaccharide, you also prevent, if it does get into your lungs, from getting into your blood. So it's important to know that distinction. There's certain spacing. So if you've had one, you should wait a certain time period, depending on the order. But it's always good to talk to your doctor or pharmacist uh, to see if you are up to date on the best protection against pneumonia. So ultimately the lesson is we want to increase, uh, continue to get vaccinated and we want to flatten the curve. So we want to, uh, our big concern is we're tracking ICU numbers for, for COVID-19, but our big concern is the limited capacity of ICU beds and with uh, things like influenza and pneumonia coming, this number is going to go up, but we can actually prevent this with vaccination. So. Uh, it's another tool we can use, and the province has recognized that, so they've invested more into their influenza campaign. That includes um, buying more doses for the province, so uh, an additional half a million doses for, for the province, and also uh, purchasing the high-dose vaccine for long-term care and assisted living. Now, just because that demographic is funded for a better vaccine for over 65, it doesn't mean those in independent living cannot access, access it by paying out of pocket. It is certainly worth it this season to get a vaccine if you're over 65, and especially if you have underlying conditions, that is 25% more effective against influenza given how difficult it's going to be this fall with influenza and COVID-19. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is that the BC Lung Association has sponsored this webinar and they also will be collaborating with myself at Immunize and a local pharmacy to provide an on-site uh, influenza clinic 
um, at the BC Lung Head Office. Uh, it will be by appointment booking. There will be a link circulated where you can book an appointment and fill out your consent form digitally. And there's also an opportunity to receive uh, recommended vaccines, the conjugate pneumococcal and Shingrix. There are COVID-19 safe immunization protocols in place with appointment booking and appropriate sanitization. And the tentative date for it is October 21st, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. So expect uh, a bulletin on that with an appointment booking link so that uh, you have an opportunity to receive uh, an influenza vaccine, whether it be the high dose or the standard dose um, that's publicly funded, in addition to Prevnar 13 and Shingrix. Okay, so that is the end of my presentation. I wanted to keep it brief uh, and so that we can open it up for any questions uh, that you may have on this topic. Um, thank you, Ajit, for that great uh, presentation. Um, like I said, um, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function or the chat function. Um, there is one question right now from okay, Stephen. Okay, so um, just getting the questions here. So feel free to send your questions to the Q&A. Uh, the first question is, will this session recording be available for viewing later? I believe it is being recorded. Uh, by the BC Lung Association. Uh, the other question is, uh, is the HDTIIV all right for someone with a egg allergy history? Well, it depends on the nature of the allergy. So uh, depending on if the allergy is severe anaphylaxis, if somebody can eat eggs and they just have simple indigestion, um, then that's fine. Um, it's actually not a strong contraindication. So depending on the nature of the allergy, in most cases, it's okay. We just ask uh, the individual to uh, hang out in the clinic area for an additional uh, 30, instead of 50 minutes, 30 minutes. Um, for anyone who has a really bad egg allergy or who's really concerned, um, I also mentioned the cell-based vaccine, which is not made in eggs. Um, that's the option I am using for those who are very concerned if they've had any really bad uh, anaphylactic type allergies to eggs. But in most cases, the HDTIV would be all right with someone with a history of an egg allergy. Okay, so as mentioned, you can put your question through into the chat. Um, the other question is, I always get a flu vaccine, but my wife doesn't believe in them and won't get one. I know this puts her at risk, but does it increase my risk? Well, the answer is actually yes, because um, we always want people and their contacts to get vaccinated against influenza. One thing the, the vaccine does do is it prevents the virus from binding to the epithelial cells, which is the cells in your nose and your throat. So if I've been vaccinated against influenza, if I do contract the virus, it actually it reduces the chance of it replicating and propagating in the back of my nose and my throat so that when I cough and sneeze, I'm not spreading it everywhere. If I don't get vaccinated, it has easy entry into those cells and it starts to replicate and I can actually spread it. So again, as we know, um, it's, uh, it's recommended that everybody in their contacts, the more people we have vaccinated against influenza, then the better the chance we have of lowering the risk of burden of disease. It's all, we're all in this together. So as we've seen when there's no vaccine, like in COVID-19, um, what we have to do, but when there is vaccines available, the more of us that get it, the less chance the disease um, has to spread. So um, it also increases, yes, I would say, increase your risk and also any family member's risk as well, or contacts, friends, anybody who's in that social bubble. Um, the, next, the next question is, would you recommend the high dose for, for older people every year, i.e. years without COVID-19? And the answer is absolutely yes. I think that 
Typically, these pandemics act as a catalyst for government to recognize the benefit of certain interventions. So I'm happy that the province is, is now covering it for those in long-term care because uh, of the devastation that that um, demographic has seen with infectious disease. But every year, influenza is a problem for those over 65. Um, it's, it's a demographic, you know, 12,000 people a year die from influenza, and that's preventable in a lot of cases. So I'd recommend it every year, uh, even without uh, COVID-19. Even if there is a COVID-19 vaccine or the disease disappears, uh, influenza is, is always going to be here every season. So I would recommend the high dose every fall uh, for those over 65. Um, my doctor recommended I have a whooping cough vaccination as uh, coughing could affect my diseased lungs. Yeah, that, that's a great, uh, a great question and, and a really good recommendation by the physician because I think that um, pertussis, also known as whooping cough, uh, can cause quite a uh, aggressive and burdensome cough. It's actually quite, it's, it's a strong cough that, that babies who get it actually have broken uh, ribs uh, in the ICU. So. Uh, increased coughing is very burdensome on the respiratory cavity. So again, if we can take that out of the equation, um, and again, if, if someone has compromised lungs, then pertussis can cause uh, an even worse, um, a worse outcome. So I think that's, again, any intervention we have since we don't have a COVID-19 vaccine, uh, that's what the Canadian Thoracic Society says, is that any tool we have, uh, we use it. So I think that's a really good recommendation. And the other good thing is that the whooping cough vaccine comes as tetanus, diphtheria, pertussis. So you also get the diphtheria protection. And diphtheria, again, due to vaccination, it is rare, but it's good to be protected because that can actually form a film on the back of your throat that can cause cho choking and asphyxiation. So um, that's, that's, again, a, a good vaccine to have. All right, great question so far. Feel free to type it in the Zoom webinar chat or into the Q&A box. I think uh, I'm looking at the Q&A box now. So this is the anonymous question. Uh, for those who had immune compromised, as in on heavy anti-rejection medications, would you recommend the high dose flu zone as well? Yeah, that's a bit more, so because the vaccine is a bit uh, newer, um, we wanna make sure that there's enough data for those who are immunocompromised. That being said, uh, we always look at sort of enhanced vaccines uh, for those who have compromised immune systems. Uh, best to check with uh, the specialist that is prescribing those meds. Um, you definitely should receive a flu vaccine. Uh, but just double check with them if, if it's okay to receive the high dose vaccine as well. So that's a great question. Um, which vaccine has a cost of $25? Um, that one is the quadrivalent vaccine based in eggs. So that's the QIV uh, is $25. Uh, the other question is, how do we request the flu zone high dose? How do we know that is what we're receiving? That is a, a, a very good question. And I think that that, that is um, a really good question because a lot of the confusion and the challenge comes, you know, if you want a flu shot, and now I've talked about all these options, as, as a patient, how do you communicate that? So th there is a bit more um, knowledge around the high dose, especially since the province has now covered it for a demographic. Uh, but you do request that I want the high dose vaccine and um, it, uh, it should be received at a clinic or a pharmacy that is stocking it. So you should always book your appointment in advance or call in advance to request that vaccine so that you make sure you get the right one. If you just show up and just book a flu shot appointment or show up for a flu shot, um, then, uh, then there's no guarantee that you'll receive it. So that's... Uh, that's a really important thing to advocate and look into it as well. Uh, the next question is, why are there no masks available for COPD specifically to prevent wildfire smoke particles from entering? It's a good question. Uh, that's where I think the, the N95 respirator comes in. Um, I know that uh, for COVID-19, like if you're going to the grocery store or going out in public, a surgical mask is fine because that just protects the droplets from coming out 
and uh, spreading it to other people. But the N95 is used for what we call aerosolizing procedures. So anybody who's intubating someone in the ICU would use it. Um, this, the, uh, the N95 is used by like the fire department. So that would, it actually would help against particulates. So uh, those are a bit more expensive and harder to find. But uh, for those who are concerned about, especially having poor air quality uh, and do have to go outdoors, um, then uh, that, uh, that N95 respirator would be the mask that you're looking for. Uh, can you please repeat the name of the conjugate for pneumonia? How many uh, do we get this after the usual free one? How, how near? Okay, so um, this question, the vaccine is called Prevnar 13. It's only one dose if you're over 50. The free one, there's a bit of a repeat dose on it. Nobody should get more than three in their lifetime. And after the over, age is over 65, they should only get one. But the conjugate is a one and done. It's not, uh, it's not free. It costs about $125, $130. Um, and you should always wait at least a year if you've gotten the free one. And the reason for that is because the conjugate drives such a strong immune response that uh, you, want, you don't want that ruined when having that free one uh, response. So wait at least a year so your immune system can mount a strong response, if not longer, if you've had the free vaccine. Um, the other question I had here is, do you expect the flu season to be less prevalent this year? It's tough to say. We usually draw our, so you saw my slideshow that there was a slide about Australia. We usually draw our experience from Australia, and what we saw is they had a mild season uh, one, because it wasn't as severe as other seasons, just luckily, uh, which, is, which is great, given that COVID-19 is prevalent as well. Um, and uh, the other reason is high immunization rates. So I'm, I'm expecting that with the province buying additional dosages, more people getting their flu shot. So typically, flu shot rates in Canada are hover around 35-40%. Now, 60% uh, of, um, uh, of Canadians are saying that they'll get a flu shot. So if that number goes up, then the disease goes down. So that's what I'm expecting. I'm expecting less prevalence. Okay, so the next question is, can you recommend any resources to convince anti-vaxxers of the safety of vaccination? So yeah, that's something I do a lot for with immunize.io is I, uh, call, I help address what we call vaccine hesitancy. So anti-vaxxers actually make up a very small portion of the vaccine we call it the vaccine hesitancy continuum, where on one end we have those who accept and are willing to get vaccines and are fully on board. And then we go way to the right where people actually are, are advocating and spreading misinformation against it. So uh, that's a small population, but majority of people are what we call vaccine hesitant. So they actually are, are cognizant of some of the benefits of vaccines, but they have some concerns. So they usually land in three domains. One is complacency. So um, resources that talk about the burden of disease, uh, things like not just death from the disease, but disability. So that's, that tends to be a good talking point with things like influenza is because even if you do survive it, a lot of people, especially if they're over 65, lose their, their mobility and their function. Um, and uh, that uh, uh, is actually, more detrimental than, than actually death in a lot of cases. Uh, and then the other thing is confidence. So vaccines are safe, they're effective, they've been around for a long time, there's data, there's checkpoints. The public uh, concern around to and tolerance on va vaccine safety is so low. Uh, it's anything that goes wrong with the vaccine, it's quickly, you know, jumped on and, and it's quickly blamed versus like an oral tablet. So there's a lot of legislation and balances in place. And finally, the last one is access. A lot of people, uh, even if they think vaccines are good and disease is bad, it's just really hard for them to get a vaccine. So I think with a lot of pharmacies doing a lot of immunizations, uh, workplace, on-site clinics, that helps people get vaccinated. So any of those three domains are good. And then you can kind of dive into a, a behavioral psychology approach where looking things like the omission bias, where people would much rather prefer to um, not do something uh, than to do something and have a bad outcome. So it's kind of like I'd rather be the one in a million people who get a side effect from a vaccine than the one in 10 that get the disease. So it's one of those things where in actually doing something and something bad happens, that actually seems worse 
but in reality it's it's a it's a psychology psychological fallacy because if you look at the numbers and the data the benefits always outweigh the risks of vaccination um if you had whooping cough as a child do you need immunization as an adult absolutely i think that the immunity to a lot of these diseases it wanes uh, very quickly uh, another question i get a lot is if i had shingles before well the chance of you having it again is even higher it's still there so there's a time period you have to wait after shingles um, before getting vaccinated but just because you get a disease doesn't mean you have lifelong immunity so uh, even if you had whooping cough as a child, uh, it's, these, those antibodies are, are, not, are not circulating. And even if you've gotten vaccinated against whooping cough, it should be done every 10 years. Um, so if I had a Shingrix now, how often do you need this vaccine? So the Shingrix is the new shingles vaccine. Um, and uh, it, uh, it's two doses, two to six months apart, and it's good for life. So if you had the two doses of Shingrix, uh, you, are, uh, you have protection against uh, shingles. Okay, so the other question is the HD versus the cell base. Good question. Someone with a mild uh, allergy to egg white, uh, over 65 with asthma-related COPD, uh, allergic as uh, asthma in the first 30 years, apart from cost, what would you recommend? Typically, I would go with the high dose uh, vaccine in this case. If it's a mild allergy to egg white, if it's a mild allergy, then the, the minuscule amount of eggs that the vaccine's in is not going to uh, have too much of an impact. But for those over 65, the glaring recommendation nationally is the high dose vaccine. Uh, are there any immediate side effects after receiving the high dose vaccine? Great question. So as I mentioned, the high dose vaccine has four times the amount of antigen than the standard dose, which will provide a better immune response and better protection against flu. Uh, its side effects are very similar, if not the same, as of getting the standard dose. Just, that would just be a local reaction, soreness, redness, itchiness at the site. That should go away maximum 48 to 72 hours. So there really isn't any statistical difference to the high dose uh, versus the standard dose vaccine. Um, so how to access the clinic locator. Um, I can send a link here. So you just Google uh, high dose flu clinic locator online and it should list all the pharmacies carrying it. Now keep in mind it is in stock now and there is high demand for it. So I can also, uh, if for those of you in Vancouver, I can um, post a phone number here um, on the chat. Let's see if I can everyone can see it. So there is a location in the Laurel Medical Building, which is close to BC Lung. Uh, Laurel Prescriptions. Uh, the number is 604-873-5511. Uh, call them to make an appointment. They do have dose in stock. So hopefully that helps. Um, okay, so any other questions? Okay, that's great. So any other questions, you can um, forward them to me through BC Lung so we can answer that. Um, and hopefully you found this informative. I think this is a really important influenza season. And this is a really important time for, for everybody who has underlying lung conditions to be informed and, and take the steps to protect themselves as much as possible. So thank you so much for your attendance and uh, enjoy the rest of your week. And Hopefully we have a mild uh, flu season. Thank you, Ajit, and thank you everybody for attending.